Welcome to the Miller Way Systems New Worker Orientation Program. This program is based on the Worker Health and Safety Awareness in Four Steps online module that was created by the Ministry of Labour in Ontario. After each step or section, you are going to be prompted to write a quiz. If you don't have the quiz in front of you now, stop this presentation and ask your supervisor to provide it for you. Once you get a copy of the quiz, come on back and we can go through the presentation together. The program is designed to provide you with the basic information you need to stay safe while working, no matter what job you do. The presentation explains to you your rights and responsibilities under Ontario's Occupational Health and Safety Act and what the expectations are for your employer, your supervisor, and you regarding health and safety. These are things that you need to know and understand so that you can be safe at work today and every day. The Occupational Health and Safety Act recognizes that your employer has the most responsibility regarding health and safety in the workplace. Why do you think this is? Well, it's because they have the most authority. Miller Waste Systems is responsible to set up a health and safety management system that protects all workers, no matter what job they do. That means that they need to have plans, procedures, and documentation in place that not only provides information to workers about the hazards of the job, but also how to protect themselves from those hazards so that everybody can stay safe while they work. Step one of this presentation is called Get On Board. At the conclusion of this section, you will be able to describe why you are important to health and safety, describe the duties of your employer, the duties of your supervisor, your duties, and the three basic rights of all workers in Ontario. A new job is a chance for a fresh start. I'm learning new skills, meeting new people. One of the first things I learned when I started working here is that every job has hazards, no matter how safe it looks. I found out that the way I can stay safe is by knowing about anything in this workplace that could hurt me or make me sick. Each one of us here, employers, supervisors, and workers, has a role to play in safety at work. If we all cooperate and do what's expected of us, we can get home safely at the end of the day. When I started working, I had no idea how often people got hurt or had a work-related sickness on the job. I didn't know that the number of people in Ontario who suffer a work-related illness or injury each year would fill the seats of a dozen big hockey arenas. I didn't know that people who are starting new jobs are four times more likely to get hurt during their first month on the job than at any other time. That's because new and young workers often aren't told about or don't understand the hazards of the job. Sometimes they don't know what questions to ask. Sometimes they don't even know who to ask. This is a poster that needs to be displayed in every workplace in Ontario. It describes the responsibilities of workers, employers, and supervisors, and also describes the three basic rights of all workers. All of this information comes from the Occupational Health and Safety Act, or the Green Book. The Occupational Health and Safety Act is a set of laws that spells out the duties of all workplace parties in Ontario. There are also other regulations that apply, depending on the type of work being performed. Generally, we fall under the industrial regs. Although WIMIS regulations, confined space regulations, these are all things that we need to follow as well. A copy of the Occupational Health and Safety Act must be posted in all workplaces. If you're looking for information, a good place to start is the Safety Board. This program will go into more detail the location of your safety board, and some of the information that you'll be able to find on the safety board. However, if you're ever looking for information, don't know where it is, 
can't find it, or do not understand it, then talk to your supervisor. They will be able to provide you with all of the information that you need in order to stay safe while you're working. Duties of the employer. Here's some of the things that your employer needs to do regarding health and safety in the workplace. Your employer must make sure workers know about hazards and dangers in the workplace and also know how to work safely. They need to make sure every supervisor knows how to take care of health and safety on the job. Your employer must create health and safety policies and procedures for the workplace. They must make sure everyone knows and follows the procedures. They need to make sure workers wear and use the right protective equipment, and they must do everything reasonable to keep workers from getting hurt or sick on the job. Duties of the supervisor. Here are some things that the Occupational Health and Safety Act says every supervisor must do. They must tell workers about hazards and dangers in the workplace and show them how to work safely. They must make sure workers follow the law and the workplace health and safety policies and procedures that were created by the employer. They need to make sure the workers wear and use the protective equipment that is recommended not only by the law, but by the employer, and they must do everything reasonable to keep workers from getting hurt or sick on the job. Duties of workers. Here are some things that the Occupational Health and Safety Act says every worker needs to do. And remember, your employer is a worker, your supervisor is a worker, you are a worker. Every workplace party must follow these duties. Follow the law and the workplace health and safety policies and procedures. Always wear or use the protective equipment that your employer requires. Work and act in a way that won't hurt yourself or anyone else. Report any hazards you find in the workplace to your supervisor especially if you don't know how to protect yourself from that hazard. Suppose you have been asked to do something that you don't know very much about. True or false, the following is what your employer and your supervisor should do in order to make sure that you can do this thing safely. That's right. Take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for your protection. Rights of the worker. I've talked about the three basic rights that you have. Your employer is responsible to make sure that we have a safe workplace and your supervisor has the same duty. They are the ones that need to tell you about hazards and make sure you know how to protect yourself from those hazards. If you're asked to do something and you don't know how to do it safely, you can speak up. You can ask somebody, can I get some help here? That should always be your supervisor. And ultimately, if you can't get the information that you need in order to stay safe, you can stop work and seek more information. Those are your three basic rights, and we're going to really explain to you in detail how those rights can be applied in the workplace. By the way, you should never worry about asking questions regarding health and safety. Nobody at Miller will ever chastise you for raising health and safety concerns or for seeking more information regarding your safety at work. In fact, it's against the law for you to be fired or punished for doing this, as long as you do it in the right manner. And this training is going to teach you how you can do this. You have the right to refuse unsafe work if there's a reason to believe it puts you or a fellow worker in danger. There's a way to do this properly, and that's what we're going to teach you. Prevention starts here, but it doesn't end here. It's quiz time. Get your quizzes ready, and we'll go through it together. First question. The thousands of people in Ontario who suffer a work-related illness or injury each year might include your neighbors, family, or loved ones. We could even say your co-workers or yourself. Is that true or false? Absolutely, that's true. Question two. New workers are less likely to get hurt on the job than people who have been on the job longer. 
Well, that's false. If you remember in the movie, they said that new and young workers are four times more likely to get injured in the first three months that they're working. The Occupational Health and Safety Act and the regulations tell everyone from the employer to the newest worker how to make the workplace safer. That's true as well. The Occupational Health and Safety Act, or the Green Book, lays out the responsibilities of all workplace parties. Question four. The Occupational Health and Safety Act puts the greatest responsibility on the employer to make sure no one gets hurt or sick on the job. Well, that's true. Remember, the Occupational Health and Safety Act says your employer has the responsibility and the authority over the workplace to ensure everyone is safe while they are working. It's against the law for my employer to fire or punish me for doing what the Occupational Health and Safety Act says. That's true too. As long as you do it in the proper manner, you cannot be fired or punished for raising health and safety concerns, asking questions, or refusing unsafe work. Congratulations, quiz number one is done. Step two, get in the know. At the conclusion of this section, you will be able to explain that you have the right to know about workplace hazards, identify examples of some common workplace hazards, identify ways that your employer and supervisor can protect you from workplace hazards, and describe the other ways to find out about workplace hazards. My name is Kevin Bonas. Uh, July 2003, I was involved in an industrial accident. I was working as an uh, industrial millwright, working on a, a piece of equipment with the uh, operator. I um, found myself uh, in a position where the machine cycled while I was in it. Uh, it amputated uh, both my feet uh, from my body. I was trapped in the machine for an hour and a half uh, while rescuers uh, got me out of the machine. Two teams of surgeons spent uh, eight hours uh, reattaching my feet. Um, after the surgery, I was, I was told that the, the success rate for the surgery was, was less than 5% and that I would most likely not be keeping my feet. Um, I can't squat, I can't run. Um, uh, my son plays hockey, I, I can't get on the ice with him, I'm unable to do that. Um, and I deal with uh, chronic pain every day. Um, hopefully, by taking this training, you will uh, you'll be able to um, I implement the lessons you learned through this training and uh, not be in the position that I'm in. Hi, my name is Dan Maxmere. I'm a health and safety consultant with the Infrastructure Health and Safety Association. Uh, I've been with this organization now for almost five years. Um, six years ago, though, however, I was a small business owner, a uh, general contractor, home builder, and I was involved in a serious accident within the construction industry. I ended up breaking my right leg between my knee and the ankle nine different places in both bones. My left ankle, actually, I shattered completely. Um, had my toe, my left work boot touching my knee. I shattered that ankle and both my leg bones halfway up the leg. I lived in the hospital for uh, couple months uh, recovering, uh, wheelchair after that for about 14 months. Uh, my business went bankrupt, uh, stopped working. The biggest thing for myself, how it affected my lifestyle is I just, even though I'm able to walk now, I just can't do the same things. I was big into sports before. I'm very limited now. I've got a do two daughters, one who is six years old now. Three years ago she could beat me in a running race. Uh, just little things like that and all just for the sake of uh, I was rushing on the job quick as I could to get things done, cutting corners, taking chances and uh, I just tell everybody when I'm training it's not worth it because one of these days you may think it's not going to happen but it, it, it could just happen so quick. Hi, my name is Patty Penny. I'm here to tell you about my son, Luke Patrick Penny. He was waterproofing a garage wall when the wall collapsed on top of him, crushing him. It was the worst day of my entire life and the worst day of my family's entire life. 
our lives will never be the same again. I don't even know how to put it into words. It was like shock, devastation. Any emotion that you could have was there. I, part of me died that night with my son. I have never been the same and I don't believe I ever will be. My family will never be the same. And hopefully somewhere in this video, people will realize and it will help them be safe at work. You need to be aware of the hazards you may encounter while you work. We've all heard stories about people who get critically injured or killed while on the job. These instances can be devastating. They can affect morale, personal lives. They can cost companies hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. Sometimes there is no recovery. There is a hazard at the root of every workplace incident or injury. The hazard either went unchecked or was ignored. This is why you need to be aware of all hazards before you start work. One of the ways Miller Waste Systems informs workers about the hazards of a job is with a JHA, or a Job Hazard Analysis. These JHAs explain to workers the hazards of the job, preventative measures that can be used to keep you safe, and also provide a risk assessment, explaining what could happen if a worker decides to break the rules. Here's a JHA for an equipment spotter, somebody who's tasked to direct equipment inside one of our facilities or maybe out on a collection route. JHAs need to be read, understood, and signed by both the worker and their supervisor before you start work. You need to know the hazards of the job that you're going to do and understand how to protect yourself from those hazards. This is how Miller does it. There are other questions that you can ask in order to make sure that you have the knowledge to protect yourself. What are the hazards of the job? Is there special training I need? Do I have the right PPE? If I have any questions about safety, who do I ask? In all of these cases, go to your supervisor. They can help. What are some other hazards, general things that you need to worry about? Loud noise, low lighting, sharp objects or equipment, objects falling from height, electricity and other energy sources. You need to know how to protect yourself if you are exposed to these hazards. Training, JHAs, safety talks, this is the way we will give you the information that you need. There are other hazards that are less obvious. Maybe you use chemicals at work. You need to be trained on the safe use of these chemicals, how to protect yourself in case there are some dangers that maybe you're not aware of. It's the employer's duty to make sure all supervisors have the knowledge and information needed to ensure a safe workplace. Employers and supervisors must inform workers about hazards and tell them how to protect themselves from those hazards. And if you ever run across a hazard and you don't know how to protect yourself, you need to talk to your supervisor so that they can fix the situation for you. Here are some other questions you can ask. If I get injured, who do I report it to? If there's an emergency, what do I do? Where do I go? If I find unsafe equipment, who should I report that to? Maybe you have to ask yourself, am I focusing on the task? Am I doing things safe? Do I know how to do things safe? If you need more training, when are you going to get it? All of these questions can be directed to your supervisor. Through further training and job hazard analysis, 
you should be able to answer all of these questions. There are lots of different ways to protect you from hazards. The best way to protect a worker from a hazard is to eliminate the hazard. If the hazard doesn't exist anymore, then there's no chance of a worker getting injured or getting sick. Other ways you can protect workers, you could cycle work. So maybe you don't expose a worker to a hazard for a full day. A good example of this is why we have teams on a lot of our garbage trucks. Half of the day a worker drives, while half of the day the worker will pick up the garbage. It's a lot easier on the workers. They are not exposed to lifting for an extended period of time. Personal protective equipment or PPE. These are items that you wear in order to protect yourself from hazards. Things like safety boots, safety glasses, gloves, reflective clothing. But remember, PPE is only effective if you actually wear it. You need to inspect it. You need to make sure that it's going to do the job you expect it to do. PPE is like a guard. A guard will protect you from a hazard in the workplace. If the Occupational Health and Safety Act or Miller says that you need to use a guard, then you need to use it. If you're told to wear your PPE, it means you must wear your PPE. There are lots of guards everywhere in the workplace. It is illegal to remove a guard from a piece of equipment that you are working on. That's something that the law is very clear about. If you find a piece of equipment that isn't guarded properly, don't do the work. Stop and let your supervisor know. You need to be aware of hazardous materials in the workplace. The WIMAS program is designed to teach workers how to recognize hazards regarding chemicals and other items in the workplace, and also how to get more information regarding protecting themselves when they're using these hazardous materials. If your job includes operating equipment, you need to be trained on how to operate that equipment in a safe manner. Whether you're driving a garbage truck, a recycling truck, maybe you operate a forklift, use an aerial work platform, or a front end loader, you need to be trained on how to use this equipment safely. There are operator manuals available for all of that equipment. They have a lot of information that you will need in order to work safely. But we have training programs that we provide to workers in order to ensure that you are always safe while you operate equipment. What you're doing right now is part of the program. Participating in health and safety training is all about learning about hazards, and understanding how to protect yourself from those hazards. In a safe and healthy workplace, everyone needs to know about hazards. If you see a hazard on the job or a close call, let your supervisor know about it. That way we can fix it, deal with it, so that no one will get hurt. Prevention starts here when everybody is aware of hazards. Quiz time. The Occupational Health and Safety Act says that you have the right to know about hazards in your workplace. True, that's one of your basic rights as a worker in Ontario. If a hazard can make you sick, you will always start to feel sick right away. This is false. Many chemicals that we use in the workplace will only affect you if you've been exposed to them without protection over a long period of time you don't always feel the effects immediately. To keep from getting hurt on the job, you need to find out about the hazards while you are working. This is false. The law says you need to know about hazards before you start working. If you have any doubts about the safety of the work you're doing, just keep those doubts to yourself. Obviously, this is false as well. We want you to speak up. We want you to be comfortable enough to go to your supervisor and ask questions 
if you really don't know a safe way to do a job. If you see a hazard while at work, you should report it to your supervisor or employer right away. This is true. If you see a hazard while you're at work and you don't know how to protect yourself and you think it can harm you or somebody else, let your supervisor know. They can give you information that you need to protect yourself. Congratulations, quiz number two is through. Step three, get involved. At the conclusion of this section, you will be able to explain your right to participate in all aspects of health and safety in the workplace. Give some examples of way that you can participate in health and safety, and you'll also understand the roles of health and safety representatives and joint health and safety committees. The right to participate in health and safety in the workplace. The Occupational Health and Safety Act gives you the right to participate by getting involved with health and safety. And there's lots of different ways you can do this. You can report hazards to your supervisor. You can provide preventable solutions. Or you could become a health and safety rep or a member of the health and safety committee. These are all true. These are all ways you can participate. I also like to describe participation as communication. If you are communicating, asking questions, talking to coworkers, talking to your supervisor, you are participating in the health and safety of the workplace. Health and safety representatives and joint health and safety committees. Most of our sites have a health and safety committee made up of representatives of workers and management. These committees meet on a regular basis, usually every three months, and they discuss health and safety concerns in the workplace. They will also provide solutions to upper management, if necessary, to some problems. The committee plays an important role in keeping workplaces safe. For example, a member of the committee who represents workers must regularly inspect the workplace. These inspections are posted on the Health and Safety Board and they are used as information and ways to improve the workplace. In some smaller workplaces where we have less than 20 workers, we will have a health and safety person that represents the workers. But their function is the same as a committee. This person will do monthly inspections and if they find issues, they will report them to management and provide some solutions to fix these issues. Here are some other ways that you can participate in health and safety. Ask questions when you're not sure. It goes back to communication. You can volunteer to be a worker health and safety rep or a member of the committee. You can help your health and safety rep or your joint health and safety committee with health and safety inspections by pointing out some hazards that maybe you're concerned about in your work area. And take the training that you receive seriously. Put what you learn into practice on your job. Remember, we are telling you how to work safely. It is up to you to make that decision and take your health and safety seriously. Be a safety role model. Think about this. A new worker shows up to a new work site and sees that only half of the people are wearing safety glasses. I'd say there's a 50-50 chance that this new worker is going to put on the safety glasses that he's been given. But how about if this new worker walks into a work site and everybody is wearing safety glasses? Do you think they're going to think twice about putting on their safety glasses? I don't think so. Remember, we all share in health and safety responsibilities. Prevention starts here. This is what a health and safety board looks like. We have one at all of our Miller work sites. These boards display information for workers to help them stay safe while they are performing their duties. This is what needs to be posted. A copy of the green book, a copy of the health and safety policy for the company, names of your health and safety rep, or members of a joint health and safety committee, the latest monthly workplace safety inspection, and minutes from the last joint health and safety committee meeting, 
if you have one at your work site. The Health and Safety at Work Prevention Starts Here poster. Names of trained first aiders. Somebody that can help you if you get injured at work. Information on what to do in case of a workplace injury or workplace emergency. This is called the 1234 poster and it's put out by the WSIB. Also workplace rules, procedures, and information on how to deal with a variety of workplace hazards, including what to do in case of violence and harassment in the workplace. Time for another quiz. It's important that you know the safe way to do your job. You should share what you know. If you see a hazard, report it to your supervisor. This is true. You should get involved in health and safety by asking questions and put what you learn from training into practice on the job. This is also true. If you can't find health and safety information posted in your workplace, go back to work. Don't worry about it. Well, of course, this is false. If you're looking for information and you don't know where to find it, or it's maybe been misplaced, let your supervisor know. We'll remedy the situation. Your health and safety rep or joint health and safety committee can help you with any concerns you might have about working safely. This is true. Remember, they are responsible to raise concerns with management and provide solutions to fix any of these concerns. It's okay to take safety shortcuts to get the work done faster and on time. Of course, this is false. It's never okay to take safety shortcuts. Take your training seriously. Take the information that was provided to you in your JHA seriously. And always put your personal safety above all else when you are performing your duties. Congratulations, you're free of quiz number three. Step four, get more help. So by the time we're finished this module, you're going to understand your right to refuse unsafe work. You're gonna recognize that your employer cannot threaten, fire, or dismiss you for exercising your right or for asking your supervisor to do what the act says they must do. And you're also gonna know where you can get some additional information about workplace health and safety. The right to refuse unsafe work. If you have reason to believe that the work you are doing or the equipment you are using could hurt you or somebody else, you can refuse to do the work. You need to contact your supervisor, contact your health and safety rep, and explain to them the situation and why you are refusing. If you are also exposed to workplace violence or harassment, you can refuse to do work as well. Some workers like doctors and firefighters do have limits on work they can refuse, but you don't. If a job doesn't feel safe, stop work and talk to somebody. Ask questions, communicate with others, and most importantly, take your safety and everyone else's seriously. Report an unsafe situation to your supervisor, contact your health and safety rep or a member of the committee and work with them to try and solve the problem. Ultimately, if this group cannot come up with a good solution, we can call the Ministry of Labor. They can send an inspector and the inspector can assist us in solving any workplace health and safety issue. There's the phone number for the Ministry of Labor. If you believe there's an unsafe situation at work and no effective solution has been brought to you, then you can call them and an inspector will come out to help. Remember though, the Ministry of Labor is going to ask you some questions. Have you talked to your supervisor? Have you talked to your health and safety rep? This is why it's important that you follow the steps correctly and in order. We talked earlier about reprisals. It's against the law for your employer or supervisor to punish you for doing what the act expects you to do or for you asking them to do what the act expects of them. 
the law is very clear on this. You cannot be fired. You cannot be punished. If you do feel that you have had action taken against you because you've been raising health and safety concerns, this is the phone number of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. The Office of the Worker Advisor provides free advice and representation for workers who are in this type of situation. You can call this number and they can help. All of this information is posted on the Health and Safety Board. If you need those phone numbers that we showed you, they are posted up there. You can use these government agencies to help you if you feel that the workplace is unsafe. If you can't find what you're looking for, remember, ask your supervisor, talk to your health and safety rep, or contact a member of the safety department. We're all here to help. There are other ways to get health and safety information. Ontario has a health and safety system that includes many partners. The Ministry of Labour has a decent website that gives lots of information about staying safe at work. Workers Health and Safety Centre. This is a government agency that provides health and safety training for workers, health and safety reps, supervisors, and employers. We do the majority of our training in-house, so we don't use the Workers Health and Safety Centre often, but we could. Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. There are six medical clinics located across Ontario that provide occupational health services and information. Let's say a worker was severely injured at work and they couldn't return to the job that they were doing previous to their injury. We could use these occupational health clinics in order to retrain the worker, give them new information, new knowledge, and a way to come back to work, maybe not at the job they were doing before, but a similar or equally important job. Health and Safety Ontario, the Infrastructure Health and Safety Association, Public Services Health and Safety Association, Workplace North, and Workplace Safety and Prevention Services. These are all health and safety associates with the Ministry of Labour and the Government Ontario that provide sector-specific consulting, training, products, and services. The Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, or WSIB. If you work for Miller Waste, you are insured under the WSIB. If you get injured, or if you get sick as a result of the work that you are doing, let your supervisor know. We have a return to work program that works in conjunction with the WSIB to ensure an early and safe return to work for you if you are injured or if you are sick. We have a package that we can give you. We will help you to fill out any forms that you need to fill out. We will make sure we get you back to work. Prevention starts here, but it doesn't end here. It's the last quiz. If you report a hazard to your employer, supervisor, and your health and safety rep, and they can't fix it, you can call the Ministry of Labor's toll-free number for help. This is true, but remember, there are steps you need to follow, and the Ministry of Labor will ask you if you followed these steps before they will send out an inspector to help. If you have a reason to believe the equipment you are using might hurt you or someone you work with, you have the legal right to refuse the work. This is true. If there's something in the workplace that you think is dangerous, or if there's a hazard and you don't know how to protect yourself, don't do the work. Stop and ask your supervisor for help. Some workers, like nurses, firefighters, and police officers, have a limited right to refuse work. This is true, but it doesn't apply to you. If it's a dangerous situation, let your supervisor know. Don't do dangerous work. It's against the law for your employer or your supervisor to fire or punish you for doing what the Act expects you to do or for asking them to do what the Act expects them to do. 
That's true. Remember, there are government agencies that can help you if you feel there are reprisals being taken against you for raising health and safety concerns. Done quiz number four. Almost out the door. Well, not quite. There's more. We're going to teach you how to respond to emergencies. We're going to teach you how to work safely with hazardous materials. You're going to learn about workplace violence and harassment, where the policy is located, where a copy of the Green Book is posted, where the Health and Safety Prevention Starts Here poster is posted, and where the names of your Joint Health and Safety Committee members are posted. This is all on the safety board. Your supervisor is going to show you where this information is. And you'll also take other training programs to learn about emergency response and WIMIS. We hope this program has been useful and you'll use the information in your day-to-day -day work. Knowing your health and safety rights and duties, the duties of your supervisor, the duties of your employer, this is all an important first step in staying safe on the job. Remember that when it comes to your health and safety, there is no such thing as a silly question. That question could save your life. Go ahead and ask it. It's fine. Once you start working, you may have more questions about your job. You can always talk to your supervisor, your health and safety representative, a member of the health and safety department, or you can send us an email at safetytraining at millerwaste.ca. We're all here to help you be safe. Congratulations. Thank you for your attention and welcome to Miller Waste Systems. If you'd like to take a break, pause the video. When you're ready to start again, press play and we'll begin the next section. Welcome to the Miller Waste Systems in-house training program for WIMAS 2015. WIMAS 2015 groups, classifies, and categorizes hazardous products. And it uses pictograms, labels, and safety data sheets to provide information to workers about safe use of these products. You need to be trained about hazards of the job that you do and ensure that you know how to stay safe while you work. You use hazardous products in the workplace. You need to know what those products are and how to protect yourself when you use them. WIMIS is a system that's designed to help workers recognize these hazardous products and also understand how to get the information they need to stay safe while they use these products. In February of 2015, Canada amended its WIMIS legislation and aligned with something called the GHS, or the Globally Harmonized System. This is more or less WIMIS for the rest of the world. That's what created WIMIS 2015. There were some changes, but as of December 1st of 2018, all workplaces in Canada were required to follow the new standard. The purpose for WIMIS really never changed though. Employers are required to provide information in the workplace regarding safe use of any hazardous products and make sure supervisors and workers have the knowledge necessary to use the products safely. Supervisors need to ensure workers are aware of hazards when working with WIMIS controlled products and follow directions in order to protect themselves. Supervisors also needed to ensure that products are used, stored, and disposed of safely, and if there is an emergency, know how to respond correctly. Workers need to be trained on general WIMIS knowledge and understand how to work safely with hazardous products. They need to be able to recognize pictograms, read labels and SDSs, and follow the directions on those labels and SDSs. Ultimately, if a worker can't find the information or doesn't know or understand how to use the products in a safe manner, they need to stop work and they need to ask for help. Staying safe and healthy at work. It's your most important job. But when it comes to hazardous products, how do you know what's in your workplace? And if you use hazardous products, 
How do you protect yourself and those around you? And what do you do if an accident happens? Well, that's what the WIMIS 2015 program is all about. The Workplace Hazardous Materials Information System. It's there to make sure you get the answers and information you need to stay safe. But remember, these questions are the key. What is the hazard? How do I protect myself? What should I do if there's an accident? And how do I get more information? WIMIS 2015 will provide you with the answers to these questions. The manufacturer, distributor, or supplier of a product is responsible for product labeling and information. And your employer is responsible for educating you on the safe handling of hazardous products you use. So what are WIMIS labels? Each hazardous product must have a label with symbols and hazard statements, providing information about the type of hazard associated with the product. There are 10 WIMIS symbols, and you need to look for them and recognize the dangers they represent. Exploding bomb, for explosive or reactive hazards. Flame, for flammable products. Flame over circle, for oxidizing products. Gas cylinder, for gases under pressure. Corrosion, for corrosive hazards to metal, skin, and eyes. Skull and crossbones can cause death or toxicity with exposure. Exclamation mark may cause less serious health effects. Health hazard may cause serious health effects such as cancer. Biohazardous, infectious materials and toxins that cause disease. Environment may cause damage to the aquatic environment. This is optional in Canada. WIMIS labels must also include warnings and precautions for safe use. Your employer is responsible for making sure WIMIS labels have been applied to all hazardous products in your workplace. But WIMIS also demands that all suppliers and distributors provide a lot more information about their products via Safety Data Sheets, or SDS. These sheets provide all the information you need to know about the product to ensure your safety and what to do in the event of an accident or emergency. These sheets must be readily available on the job site to all workers. Once your employer has made sure both labels and safety data sheets are in place, you must be trained on how the system works including the safe use and handling of all the hazardous products in your workplace. So, those are the basic facts. But it all comes back to you asking the four questions. What is the hazard? How do I protect myself? What should I do if there is an accident? And how do I get more information? Because the most important thing is you going home safe at the end of each day. Let's talk about the groups, classes, and categories of WIMIS 2015 products. WIMIS 2015 has taken all of the products that fall under the legislation and put them into two different groups, physical hazards and health hazards. Products in the physical hazard group could injure you if you use them and don't protect yourself. So maybe you use a product and it ends up catching fire and burns you, or maybe it explodes and causes you a physical injury. Products in the health hazard group could make you sick if you use them and don't protect yourself. And this could be anything from a minor reaction like watery eyes or maybe a skin rash up to something very severe, like you could end up getting cancer, or maybe the product is a very, very dangerous poison and it could kill you. These two groups contain the 31 classes of products for WIMIS 2015. 
Each class is descriptive. So if you know what the class of the product is, you know what the hazard is. And each class is assigned a number. And those numbers go from one to four. One is the most severe or dangerous. Here's the safety data sheet for air brake antifreeze, product that we use all the time in our trucks and our facilities. Section two of the safety data sheet has all of the information regarding the groups, classes, and categories of the product. You can see it falls under both the physical hazard group and the health hazard group. And there are nine different types of classes or hazards, and they're descriptive. They tell you how the product can hurt you. And they even have the category. You see reproductive toxicity, category 1B. That means that this product is very dangerous. And if you use it and don't protect yourself, you could end up with severe reproductive problems. I think this is a really good example of how we need to make sure SDS sheets are available and that we check them out, we read them, and we understand these products are hazardous and we better protect ourselves when we use them. WIMAS 2015 Pictograms. Pictograms are pictures, and these pictures are used to communicate hazards to you without using any words. Each pictogram is an image that's designed to help you immediately recognize the hazard of the product. The two pictograms you see on your screen represent health hazards or different ways a chemical could make you sick. There are 10 pictograms in total. Canada uses the biohazard symbol as part of WIMAS 2015. But we've also made the environmental pictogram optional. Let's go back to air brake antifreeze in the safety data sheet. You can see in section two, there are four different pictograms telling you in pictures all about the hazards of the product. In this section, we'll talk about WIMAS 2015 labels. WIMAS 2015 uses two different types of labels on their products, either supplier labels or in some cases, workplace labels. Supplier labels will tell you the name of the product. This is called the product identifier, and it's usually at the top of the label. Supplier labels will have the hazard pictogram. Remember, hazard pictograms are pictures representing the hazard of the product. Supplier labels will include signal words. In this case, the signal word is danger. There are two types of signal words though. There's either danger or warning. If it says the word danger, it means it's a very high hazard and you need to take extreme caution while using the product. But if it says the word warning, it doesn't mean that the product isn't dangerous. It just means you still need to take precaution but if you are exposed to the product, you won't be severely injured. Next are hazard statements. They follow the signal word and tell you the hazards of the product. In this case, if you drink the product, you could die. But if you spill it on your skin, you might get an irritation. This goes back to the pictograms. The skull and crossbones is telling you this is a very dangerous poison while the exclamation point is telling you it's a harmful product, and in this case, you could get an allergic reaction. Precautionary statements is information on the label that you can use to use these products safely. In this case, it'll tell you what PPE you can wear, or how to store the product, or if you get exposed to the product, first aid measures that you can take. The supplier identifier is who we can contact if we need more information. Generally, it is at the bottom of the label, and this is the company that either made the product or supplied the product to a distributor. We can contact them if we need an updated SDS sheet 
or if we need further information regarding the safe use of the product. All of this information will be in French as well as English, and every Wemyss Control product sold in Canada must have a supplier label affixed to the container. Now, in some cases, we can use workplace labels. There are only three requirements for Wemyss workplace labels. You need the name of the product, you need how to handle the product safely, and you need a reference to the SDS if you want more information. There are three instances when workplace labels can be used. If the original supplier label is no longer legible, or if it's been removed from the container, you can replace it with a workplace label. If you take the product from the original container, put it into another container, you would use a workplace label to label the product. And if we made a product, didn't sell it, but use the product in-house, then workplace labels would be sufficient, even though that doesn't really apply to what we do. Under the Wemyss 2015 standard, there has been a slight change to labeling requirements when transferring a product. If a worker takes a product from one container and puts it into another container, and they use all of the product immediately, or if they don't use it all, but they retain control of that container, then they don't need to put the safe handling precautions on the label, and they don't need the reference to the SBS on the label. In this case, the name of the product is sufficient. But remember, you can only do this if you either use all of the product immediately, or if you as the worker retain control of this container. This is done so that it will protect other workers from the hazards of this product, the people that don't necessarily know what you put into this new container. We've talked a lot about SDSs to this point, and you're probably wondering what they are. Safety data sheets are your guide to safely working with hazardous materials in your workplace. There's a lot of technical information on a safety data sheet, but there is also practical information that you can use in order to protect yourself while using hazardous products. Everything that is known about the hazardous nature of the product is summarized in the SDS. They are provided to us from the supplier or the manufacturer of these products, and we need to have an SDS for every hazardous product that we have in the workplace. Safety data sheets have 16 sections that are presented in a set order. You want to know what type of fire extinguisher you need while using these products? Section 5 will give you this information. How about the personal protective equipment that you need? You can check out Section 8 and it will give you all of the details you need. Let's say we no longer need a product and we want to dispose of it. Section 13 will give us the information on how to do this in a safe manner. Let's go back to the safety data sheet for air brake antifreeze. It contains all 16 sections and gives workers all of the information they need to work safely with the product. If there isn't an SDS for a hazardous product that you are using in the workplace, what should you do? Well, as always, you ask your supervisor. If you don't know where you can find your SDSs, what should you do? Same answer. You're going to ask your supervisor. Let's just have a quick review. Wemyss 2015 uses pictograms or pictures as a way to communicate hazards of the products without using words. All Wemyss controlled products must have a supplier label on the container with all of the required information. Workplace labels can be used when transferring products between containers or when the original supplier label is no longer legible. 
Safety data sheets will have all of the detailed information you need to work safely with hazardous products in the workplace. We need to have these safety data sheets available for workers to check if they need that information while they are working. If you're looking for a safety data sheet and you can't find it, don't use the product. Go to your supervisor and get some help. What are some of the WEMIS products that you might use while you're working at Miller Waste Systems? Engine oil, hydraulic oil, diesel fuel and gasoline, all lubricants and fluids that we use in our trucks or our other equipment, some cleaning products we use, fire extinguishers, some spill absorbent. These are all hazardous products that fall under the WEMIS 2015 standard. Remember, these products are classified as hazardous, meaning that they can and they will harm you or make you sick if you use them without taking proper precautions and without protecting yourself. Recognize the hazards, read your labels, read your safety data sheets, follow the instructions, and ask for help if you're not sure where to find the information. This is what you need to do to keep you safe. Thank you very much for your attention. It is quiz time. Ask your supervisor for a copy of the quiz and good luck. If you'd like to take a break, pause the video. When you're ready to start again, press play and we'll begin the next section. Welcome to the Miller Way Systems in-house training program for emergency response. In this program, we will go over the emergency contacts, a list of names and numbers that you can refer to if you are ever in an emergency. We will also go over some procedures, what to do in case we have to do a building evacuation. How do we respond to fires? If you or your coworker gets injured, how do we deal with that type of situation? If there is violence and harassment in the workplace, what procedures do we need to follow in order to make sure everybody stays safe? We'll also talk about dealing with spills, some other emergencies, and some general procedures that you need to know if you work for Miller Waste Systems. You need to be trained on what to do in case you are in an emergency situation. Each Miller Waste Systems transfer station, material recovery facility, shop, compost facility, and office area must have a documented emergency response plan in place. We also have specific procedures for our CSRs and other workers to follow in case of an emergency situation, while they're performing collection duties, or maybe while they are operating equipment in one of our facilities. All of our employees, no matter what their duties, shall be trained and aware of procedures to be followed in case of an emergency. Emergency contacts. The safety board in our locations will have a list of emergency contacts and phone numbers for police, fire, and ambulance, and any other numbers you may need. The address and the phone number of the facility you are calling from, as well as the address and phone number of the closest hospital are all posted. Contact numbers for the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of the Environment, Poison Control, and a spills cleanup company are all posted as well. Ultimately, if you are in an emergency and you don't know who to contact, you can dial 911 for help. Emergency procedures. Fire, fire, fire. What are we gonna do? Well, we're going to remain calm. If we ever have to evacuate a facility because of a fire or some other emergency, there are route maps posted in all of these facilities. They show the location of emergency exits, fire extinguishers, and the meeting point, the place where you are to go after you evacuate. Do you know where your emergency meeting area is? Well, 
it's posted on the fire safety site plan and your supervisor can also explain to you where to go in case we need to evacuate. If you ever have to evacuate one of our buildings, exit through the closest door and wait at the meeting area. If you are the last person to leave a room, close the door behind you. If you operate a piece of rolling equipment, like a front end loader or a forklift, if it's safe to do so, drive the equipment out of the facility, close the door behind you, and then proceed to the meeting area. It's very important that you go to the meeting area and wait for further instructions. Now is not the time to go to your car, to grab a smoke, or to run up to the corner to get a coffee. A supervisor is going to do an attendance at the meeting area and make sure that everybody got out of the facility. If you're not there, they're going to think that you're still inside. But come on, how often do we really have to deal with fires? Well, sometimes our trucks catch on fire. Okay, this is round thing. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Let's discuss what happened in that video. Something inside of our truck caught fire. 
Our driver noticed it and called his supervisor, who immediately called 911. The driver pulled the truck to the side of the road and began to compact the load. Basically, he was squeezing the load together, trying to limit the amount of oxygen that could get to the burning material. Sometimes this actually puts the fire out, although in this case that did not happen. It was still burning and it was still smoking quite badly. The driver waited for emergency personnel to show up, first the police and then the fire department. Once the fire department was set up, the driver opened the back of the truck and dumped the load onto the ground, where the fire department could then pour water onto the burning material. This is a great example of how we need to handle fires inside of our trucks. Nobody panicked. There was no damage to our vehicle and everybody was safe. Our driver was safe, emergency personnel were safe, and members of the public were safe. But what happens if we have a fire inside one of our facilities? That video showed a member of the Miller Waste Fire Brigade, a trained worker wearing fire resistant clothing and a full face mask with supplied oxygen, working with the fire department, bringing buckets of burning material out of a facility so that the fire department could dump water onto it. If we have a waste fire inside one of our facilities, the fire department will not go into the building to put the fire out we need to bring the burning material to them. The majority of our garbage fires are caused by rechargeable batteries. Watch what happens when we crush a rechargeable battery with a loader bucket. We do our best to be proactive. We try and keep batteries and other flammable materials out of the waste stream. Try and keep it out of our facilities. But if we do end up with a fire inside one of our buildings, let's get the burning material out of the building. We can spread it around in a parking lot and then we can dump water on it. Or we can call the fire department and they can come and dump water on it. You can see that we usually use water to extinguish waste fires. Water works well because it soaks the garbage down, making it very, very hard for the fire to spread. You can use a fire extinguisher too, and using a fire extinguisher is pretty easy. But with a fire extinguisher, you actually have to be able to get to whatever is burning. If you can remember the word pass, then you can operate a fire extinguisher. Step one for P, pull the pin. Step two, you aim. You aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. You aim at whatever is burning. Step three, your first S is squeeze. You squeeze the two handles together. And then the final step is the second S. You sweep from side to side. Aim at the base of the fire, stand downwind from any smoke, and pull aim, squeeze, and sweep. Fires kill more than 3,000 people in the United States each year. And if we're going to have to deal with these fires at home, in the office, in the shop, wherever, we have to know how to use a fire extinguisher. When you encounter a fire, you have to make a conscious decision. 
Is it worth me trying to put it out with a fire extinguisher? Should I just back out of there and call 911 and let the professionals take care of it? Every company is going to have someone in charge of checking these visually on a monthly basis. Every year you'll have them sent away to be checked by the professionals, but the monthly checks are pretty simple. Let's make sure that they're charged. Let's make sure all the parts are in place, that the hose is in good condition, that they're mounted in the right place. It's easy to lose track of one of these things if they get used. Make sure it gets put back, it gets recharged, because you never know when you're going to need to use one. If you happen upon a fire that is small enough for you to actually fight with one of these smaller fire extinguishers, all you have to remember is the acronym PASS. PASS helps us learn how to use this thing safely and not forget it when our mind is being preoccupied by the blaze. P is for pull, and we're going to pull the pin. The pin is here to make sure that this thing doesn't accidentally get discharged. It's really the only thing that's stopping these two levers from coming together and discharging the unit. When we pull the pin, make sure we're not squeezing together. We're just holding on the underside. It should be pretty easy to pull. It should have some sort of a tether on it or maybe a plastic band. Discard both of those things. And that's where we're going to go ahead and grab this nozzle and move on to our next letter. Grab this nozzle and we're going to aim at the base of the fire. Stay a nice safe distance away. And S is for squeeze. When we squeeze this handle, we'll discharge the unit. And the last thing we're going to do is sweep. We're going to sweep at the base of the fire and try to put out the flames from the bottom up. If the fire is too big to fight, if a fire extinguisher can't put the fire out or we can't get the burning material out of the building, then we're going to have to evacuate the building. If you hear the fire alarm go off, if there's a warning bell, an air horn that goes off, or even if you hear somebody yell, fire, 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 then evacuate the building as soon as possible. Go to the nearest exit and head to your meeting point. Medical procedures. Uh-oh, I think I'm hurt. What should I do? Well, you're gonna remain calm. Any type of injury, no matter how serious it is, must be reported to your supervisor. Even if you're just grabbing a Band-Aid from a first aid kit, you need to let your supervisor know. A worker trained in first aid should assist you to make sure that you get the proper treatment, even if it's just a Band-Aid. Trained first aiders are posted on the safety board. If you don't know the names of the trained first aiders, ask your supervisor. There's a good chance that your supervisor has had first aid training anyways. Make sure you fill out the first aid treatment record form. There's one posted at all of our first aid kits. For more serious injuries, you may need to fill out an instant report form. This is a form that you will get from your supervisor. And if you need help filling out this form, your supervisor can assist you with that. Critical injuries must be reported to the Ministry of Labor as soon as possible. The reporting and investigation of critical injuries will be handled by the safety department. The Ministry of Labor has a definition for a critical injury. This is a serious injury that places life in jeopardy, that could produce unconsciousness, that could result in a substantial loss of blood, could involve the fracture of an arm or a leg, but not a finger or a toe, could involve the amputation of an arm, hand, leg or foot, but not a finger or a toe. An injury that could burn a major part of the body or an injury that could cause the loss of sight in an eye. In the event of a fatal or critical injury in the workplace, we cannot disturb the area until the Ministry of Labor has performed an investigation. Unless we are attempting to save a life or prevent further catastrophic damage, we must leave the area as is. A Ministry of Labor inspector will come, they will do their investigation, and then they will clear the scene and allow us to do our own investigation. No matter what, if you are seriously injured at work and you need to see a doctor, make sure your supervisor is aware. There are some forms that you will need to take to your medical professional if you get injured at work. The WSIB provides insurance for injured workers, but there's some documentation that they will need before they pay out a claim. 
We can help you with all that. Just make sure you tell your supervisor what happened. Workplace violence. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to remain calm. Miller Way Systems has a zero tolerance policy regarding violence and harassment in the workplace. If you are being harassed or threatened in any way while working, and this could be from a coworker, from a supervisor, or even a member of the public, you can stop work, move to a safe area, and request for help. This could include calling a supervisor, a member of the human resources team, a member of the safety department, or in very dangerous situations, you can call 911. We have a policy for the prevention of violence and harassment in the workplace. It's posted on the safety board and will provide you with information on how to safely deal with violent and harassing persons or behavior. Spills. Guess what you're going to do? Remain calm. We are required to clean up any type of spill that might occur during the course of a workday. Whether it's fluid from a leaking hydraulic line, organic juice from a truck, or fuel as a result of overfilling a tank. All spills must be cleaned up thoroughly so they do not pose a hazard to any person or have a negative impact to the environment. We have a safe work practice on spill cleanup. It's posted on the safety board. If you have a spill, notify your supervisor. Control the spill as best you can and wait for further direction and assistance. We have many written procedures for dealing with other emergencies. Let's say you blow a hydraulic line. We have procedures you can follow to control the spill effectively. How about if you're driving a vehicle and you come into contact with overhead power lines? We have procedures to make sure that you can stay safe. What if you're involved in a motor vehicle collision? There are procedures that you need to follow. We even have procedures for setting up emergency warning devices if your truck breaks down on the side of the road. No matter what, in any emergency situation, you can keep calm and you can carry on. We have a procedure for that. All of the procedures that you need to know will be provided to you in your orientation or job specific training booklets. You can also check out the emergency preparedness and response plan. It's located at the safety board and it has a lot of information on what to do in case of emergency. So now what? Well, let's do a review of what we've discussed so far during your training. You've been provided the information you need to be a safe worker. We've talked about your three basic rights. You have the right to know the hazards of the job and how to protect yourself. We do this using job hazard analysis forms and through job specific training programs. You have the right to participate in health and safety in the workplace. You do this by communicating or you could become a health and safety rep or a member of a joint health and safety committee. You have the right to refuse work that you believe is unsafe. If you think the work you're doing could harm you or a coworker or even a member of the public, you must stop that work, call your supervisor and work with your supervisor to try and solve the problem. You also have responsibilities regarding health and safety. You must follow the law and specific workplace policies and procedures. You must wear and use the PPE that your employer, Miller, tells you to wear. You must always work in a safe manner. And you must report hazards and injuries to your supervisor, especially if you don't know how to control that hazard. There are hazardous products in the workplace that you may come into contact with. These products are labeled and they have pictures to warn you of the dangers of the product. There are also safety data sheets provided. Read your safety data sheets to get all of the information you need to work with these products safely. At Miller, we are committed to the safety of all of our workers and the public we provide a service to. 
We believe and follow the motto of being only the best, meaning that we strive to provide the highest level of customer service. This is not what we do. After this video was uploaded to Facebook, it went viral and made the news all across Canada. The worker in this video lost his job because of his behavior. He was stealing from the company and from the township that he was working in. He was putting extra weight in his truck so that he could make more money. Blair MacArthur, the owner of Miller Waste, saw this video and called this behavior unacceptable. At Miller, we are only the best. We have zero tolerance for theft and dishonest behavior. Marketplace, coffee's on. We're back. Okay, let's see what we got this time. Back on the trail of coffee cups you thought you recycled. Gloves on. We want to know if Canada's two biggest coffee chains have cleaned up their act and started recycling coffee cups. Oh, nasty, 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 nasty. Hey, okay, here we go. Tim Hortons and Starbucks promise they recycle your cup when you put them in bins like these. So three months ago, Marketplace put those claims to the test using tricked out cups. Those cups went in the recycling, but when we returned, we found them in the trash. There it is. It's in the garbage only. After that, Starbucks stores across Canada posted signs like this saying they regret disappointing any customers and will make things right. Did they? You asked us to keep the heat on. So we're going back to the same Toronto stores we checked out last time. Hi, can I please have a medium steep tea? Can I have a tall blonde, please? So if I put this in the blue bin, will it be recycled? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. At Starbucks, once again, we're assured our cup will be recycled. Same at Tim's. We'll return to see where they end up this time. Okay, here we are. Last time, Tim Hortons threw the cups we recycled in the garbage. It's in the other no. one. Okay. This one. This one. Same thing as last time. It's like a black pitch. garbage bag, and it's all garbage here. In the trash. Maybe we'll get different results at this Tim's. If we get in. Oh, damn. Why is it? Oh, oh there. Okay. Oh, God. Watch this side. Oh, this side is disgusting. <laughs> okay. Okay. There we go. In the garbage. So Tim Hortons, the same thing. In two There's places. There's no change. First two, fail. Better luck at the next one. Ew. Okay. <laughs> nope. And it's clearly labeled yeah. garbage only. Three times, three times, Phil. Tim Hortons says they're proud of their recycling initiatives, but finding our cups in the trash makes us question if they should be. Next stop. Starbucks. It never used to say mixed recycling. Look at these brand new bins. Those are brand new stickers. With mixed recycling labels. No, we're so we're close, here. we're so close. But where's that cup we're tracking? Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay, so this was in mixed, mixed recycling, recycling, which is new, right? I don't know what mixed recycling means, but let's hope it's getting recycled. At the second Starbucks we visit, we find our cup in the mixed recycling as well. More new bins at our third stop, too. Looks like Starbucks is making some changes, but does this mean the cups are actually being recycled? With the help of a local coffee shop, we call Wasteco, the private hauler Tim Hortons and Starbucks pay to pick up their recycling in Toronto. We ask what services they offer 
and you won't believe what we hear. Do you recycle coffee cups? No one does. No one? No one. I'll tell you they do, but you, I guess you didn't see the CBC Marketplace thing. The sales rep doesn't know he's talking to Marketplace. Coffee cups will not be recycled. The problem is, is that people say we will accept this, which is completely different from we will find a final home. So let's send it right to the landfill. Instead of driving around and wasting resources, pretending it's going to get recycled. No, the coffee cups are just not going to happen. That's the reality, dear. That is real. That is real. He doesn't mince words. So we call Waste head office to confirm what we hear. They say the sales rep has it wrong that they do send cups out for recycling. But they won't tell us exactly where, and they refuse to talk about Starbucks and Tim's. This is not what we do. The CBC exposed these companies for lying to their customers, telling them that they were recycling when they really weren't. Working in the waste industry requires following laws, regulations, legislation, and standards. Take pride in your work. Remember, there's probably somebody watching you or maybe even filming you. Do a good job. Be only the best. How about the salesperson that spoke to the CBC without even knowing it? If anyone ever approaches you asking detailed questions about the job you're doing, politely tell them to call head office. One of our managers there can give them the information that they're looking for. We don't want you to say something that is maybe wrong and have it come back against you or the company. This is definitely what we do. Nathaniel likes to take care of the recycling. So does Ryan, and that's where this friendship started. I'm waiting for him. You're waiting for him? Yeah. Do you get excited when he comes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Nathaniel Vita has developmental challenges. Finding a close buddy has never been easy until a few years ago when this friend turned up curbside. Come on, Nathaniel. Hey. How you doing today, buddy? Good, 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 good. I developed into stepping outside and meeting up with him, and then one thing led, led to the next, and then he was following him every week. And Bernadette's not joking about following. This get-together lasts for hours. Nathaniel will walk side by side on his route, and he will spend several hours with him. Yeah, he's really interested in everything that I seem to be doing, so it's kind of nice, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then from there, it just became a friendship. You think this is fun, don't you? Yeah, yeah you're loving it. I know, I know, I know. Nathaniel's had a bit of a rough road lately. He lost his job at a big box store stocking shelves, and he's having a tough time finding another one. And any time you need any help, Nathaniel is there. The neighbors say Nathaniel is a good worker and that he just needs to find an employer who understands. I want them to be compassionate and open to the idea of um, uh, having these guys prove, like, prove their abilities and skills. Yeah. Compassionate like Ryan? compassionate like Ryan. You're right. Rain, snow, minus 40, he's out there every single time. And here's why. Because he, 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 he's my, 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 my friend. Your friend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a special connection that started thanks to Recycling Day and a friendship that will continue same time next week. Yeah. That's it, eh? Yeah. See you next week? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah? Yeah. Tom Hayes, Global News. Ryan went above and beyond, and in becoming a friend to Nathaniel, he really defines what it means to be only the best. Providing exceptional customer service and participating in making the communities we service better places to live is what separates us from all of the other waste companies. Once again, welcome to Miller Waste Systems, and thank you for choosing to be only the best.